Well, with apologies for the technical problems, but uh, my tablet pen is now working again. So, where were we? I just told you about the negation, what it meant to not have limit Q as extended to A. And now, we could look at what it means to be continuous. The function is continuous at A. Again, this time you need to know a value at A, f of A, and the limit has to exist and be the right value. So it's not just any old limit as you approach A, but the limit as you approach A of f of x has now got to be equal to the value of the function at the point. Otherwise, you say the function is discontinuous, which means either the limit doesn't exist or it does exist and is not equal to f of A. So again, to be discontinuous is again a, got two different parts to it, two different ways that can happen. But in terms of sequences, there's a very useful condition, which is one of, the, one of the most useful ways we'll have for characterizing continuity in terms of sequences. And here it is. This time, the sequence Xn is allowed to include values A. And what you get is that uh, you, you take any sequence in R to the D, which converges to A, and some, some of those Xn's could be A if they want to be, not that it makes much difference. As long as for every sequence in R to the D, which converges to A, when you look at the sequence of values, f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, that's got to tend to f of A, and then tends to infinity. If that works, then you're continuous at that point. And you should check the details why, it, why you don't have to insist that xn is not equal to A. Because in fact, you could insist that xn is not equal to A, and it would still give you a perfectly good definition of continuity. But allowing some of the xn's to be A doesn't make any difference, and that's something for you to think about. OK, so that's continuity and function limits in terms of sequences. Except that we always defined ourselves on the whole of R to the D. But you could work with just some domain in R to the D instead. So now, instead, you take a non-empty set D contained in R to the D, and you want to look at function limits. And you hit a slight problem. You want to say, let's look at sequences in the set which approach this point. If you're dealing with function limits, you want to look at sequences in the set which are not equal to A, but which tend to A. But there might not be any. Suppose, suppose uh, D is just the point, the set with 1 and 2 in it contained in the real line. D's got two points, and they're both isolated. There you are, there are your two points of D. D's got two points, and they're both isolated. In D, meaning there's no way to approach either of them using a sequence of points from the rest of D. Because if you throw one away, D's only got the point 2 in it, so any sequence you take in D avoiding 1 will only have 2's in, and it's going to tend to 2 instead. So if you've got isolated points, then you're going to have trouble with your sequence definition. So the idea is you work only with sets which don't have isolated points. What was this definition of isolated point? Um, let's just bring that back down. Hold on. Um, What's an isolated point? If there's some positive real number, so that A is the only point of D that's within distance R of A. So here's a typical example where the only point of D within distance a half of 1 is 1. And the only point of D within distance a half of 2 is 2. So they're both isolated. 
for r to allow to be, you know, this positive real number r could be very small, but as long as this point is well away from the rest of d, then it's isolated. So we attempt to make the same definitions as before for a function that's only defined on some domain d, some non-empty subset d of r to the d, taking values in r to the l. We try the same thing as before, and we make exactly the same definition. We look at all possible sequences in d take away a, which converge to a, and we ask, is it always true that f of xn tends to q as n tends to infinity under that setting? But you hit a problem. Um, this definition only makes sense if it's a non-isolated point. So we go ahead and we just write the same definitions down again. I won't bother reading them all out again. But what happens is the definition of function limit has a problem um, with uh, isolated points. So you have to have a look at the uh, definition of function limit and continuity and try and figure out what's going on when you do have an isolated point. I'll give you for three. If you have an isolated point in your set, then every real value function is continuous there. You can't avoid continuity at an isolated point. You get it for free. Uh, but you can't talk about function limits. What's the definition of continuity? Because we'd like continuity to work anyway. With continuity, you don't need to worry about isolated points. You can use this definition and it works. If it's not an isolated point, this is equivalent to the one we just had above. If it is an isolated point, you can still use this one. You can't talk about function limits, but you can do this. So again, it's just like before. This time, the XNs are allowed to be A if they want to. And that eliminates the problem of isolated points because you can always find a sequence in D converging to A because you could use a constant sequence A, 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 A forever. So there's no longer any problem finding a sequence tending to A. And so this thing about for every sequence tending to A, something happens, makes a bit more sense. And again, you look at every possible sequence tending to in D, which converging to A, and you look at the function values, f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, you ask, does that always tend to f of a as n tends to infinity? And if it does, you're continuous there. As I've said, from the point of view of proving theory, working with sequences is really neat, as we're going to see when we prove some of our theory. From the point of view of being able to check whether a function satisfies this condition is not very nice at all. So I've already answered this exercise. If A is an isolated point, this condition is automatically satisfied. And the function has to be continuous. Now, you're continuous on the whole of D means you're continuous at every point of D. Otherwise, you're a discontinuous function. To be discontinuous means that at least one point means at least one point where continuity fails. So discontinuous at one point means you're a discontinuous function, even if you're continuous everywhere else. Uh, remember, we only, we're not talking about places where the function is undefined. The function is supposed to be defined on the whole of D. So this question of continuity or discontinuity is not a question about whether the function is defined or not, but whether there's some problem with the limits. So I've mentioned all this stuff already about standard functions and calculus. Um, these coordinate projections are, in fact, polynomials in several variables. Notice if you've got the map defined on R squared that takes x, y to x, you can regard that as a polynomial in x and y, but a rather boring polynomial which only mentions x and doesn't mention y. And similarly, for the function that takes x, comma, y to y, that's a polynomial x and y that's a very boring polynomial that happens not to mention x. But it still can be regarded as a function of x and y, which is different from the function from r to r defined to be y. Because if you're insisting that your domain is r squared, that means it's got a different domain. A different domain means a different function. 
So note that the domain here is R squared, not R. So even though it looks as if you're talking about a function of one variable, it's not. It's a function of two variables here. It's just not a very interesting one. So then you generalize it. Of course, if you've got x, y, and z, then, then you get polynomials in x, y, and z. If you've got x, y, z, and t, you get polynomials in x, y, z, and t. But if you've got um, um, a million coordinates, you're not going to want to get into that. So it's better to call the coordinates x1, x2, up to xd, because after all, d could be a million. Um, and then you're going to run out of letters of the alphabet rather quickly. But you can still think of this as polynomials in several variables. It's just it might be a polynomial in, in a million variables. I don't think I need to say anything more about that, so I won't put anything in this gap. We've already seen plenty of examples of uh, coordinate projections. So this is the warning I mentioned earlier about you only ask about continuity at points where the function is defined. For us, the function f of x equals 1 over x is not defined when x equals 0. So it doesn't make sense to ask, is it continuous at 0 or discontinuous at 0? Because it's not defined there. So you can't even ask. In particular, this is not a discontinuous function from R to R. For us, some people use different terminology. This is not a discontinuous function from R to R. Because it's not a function from R to R. And if it's not a function from R to R, then it can't be a discontinuous function from R to R. So discontinuous function from R to R, yes? Um, Hang on a second. Uh, for us, f of x equals 1 over x is not defined. Oh, which one, sorry? This is, um, sorry, I'm afraid I haven't fa figured out where... You can't ask. Yeah. Is f continuous at zero? Sorry, that's a, a con CTS is an abbreviation for continuous. I, w I will use CTS as, a, as an abbreviation for continuous. Uh, thanks for asking. I, I I forgot about that. There's a. Uh, there are some words which it gets tedious to write out in full all the time, and, and uh, we get sloppy sometimes <laughs> and start writing them out in short. So you could write dis discontinuous there this way if you're fed up of writing it discontinuous in full. Okay, oh, we should stop there because we're out of time. <laughs>